So we've been talking about humankind and the different societies that anthropologists discuss that um, we've experienced as humans over our 200,000 to 400,000 year history. Um, most of that time, of course, spent in small scale societies or what are also called tribes um, in which we're egalitarian, um, you know, based on a reciprocity and generosity. They were the, the center of power was in the family, in the household, and uh, community decisions were made by those families, by the households. Um, and they tended, one of the traits too, is having um, a really uh, a respectful relationship with their other, their, the non-human relations, the animals, the plants, you know, the other beings who inhabit this planet. Um, and anthropologists tell us that those small scale societies or tribes are the only sustainable society we've had in human history. So we took a look at those and then we are examining large scale societies that began about 6,000 years ago with the rise of cities in some cultures um, and agriculture that is intensified plant cultivation on a large scale um, and the rise of hierarchy, stratification, standing militaries and predatory expansion against neighbors um, to kind of summarize it real briefly. And of course, the rise in population growth that begins with large scale society. So now let's continue taking a look at um, global scale societies and finally wrapping up with corporocracies or corporatocracies. All right, so large scale societies um, started about 6,000 years ago. They were defined by the rise of cities and agriculture and that sort of thing. So global scale societies are like large scale societies, just even bigger yet. And they are very recent, about 500 years or so, plus or plus or minus, but 500 years is a really good marker. 1492 is kind of when you see the advent, the launching of global scale societies. So global scale so societies take all the, the characteristics and traits of large scale and expand on them. So global scale societies, like I said, have been around for about 500 years. The seat of power where the power, what ha the, the entity that has the most influence on the decisions that are made in these global scale societies actually is no longer even human. And that's a chilling thought. With global scale societies, the thing that has the most influence on that society's decisions is how well the national economy is doing. Everything, every decision that the centralized government makes or that local school districts make or, you know, that um, municipal governments make, everything that these governmental entities, which right at the beginning uh, almost always are completely separate from the families who make up the community. You know, this is not a tribal scale society decision-making process where everybody, all families are engaged in the decision-making process. This is many times we move, like in large scale societies, there's central governing units that make these decisions that impact everybody. But what most often, what has the strongest influence on those decisions is always what will benefit the national economy. Can everybody have health care? Well, how will that impact the economy? Can, you know, we have a basic living income for everybody so nobody's starving and nobody's homeless? Well, how will that affect the economy? Um, can we make sure everybody has a livable wage? Well, how will that affect the economy? It always comes back to what decisions will we make in order to best benefit the national economy? That's what has the most, not the only, but the most influence on the decision-making power of global scale societies. Global scale societies, before I get into here and maybe I'll get to the traits, this in the traits, so I'll be repeating myself, but that's okay. Essentially, the one of the big difference between large scale societies and global scale societies is large scale tends to be expansion against immediate neighbors, right? And then that can gradually get bigger and bigger and you get, you get um, city states, then you get nation states, and then sometimes you might even get empires, but it's all a contiguous land mass. It tends to be a contiguous landmass, all a connecting landmass. With global scale societies, that jumps, that jumps oceans, right? So the British Empire is no longer just expanding against Ireland. <laughs> it's going into Africa, it's going into Australia, it's going into North America. Um, Spain is no longer just expanding against its, or, or you know, the uh, Spanish governments, whatever, what it would have been 
3,000 years ago, 2,000 years ago, 1,000 years ago, whatever would have represented different Spanish governments at that time. Um, they're no longer just expanding against their neighbor. They are now going into South America, and, and we have all these countries now. They're going into all these different other places. Um, it just goes on and on like that. So the idea is global-scale societies are like large-scale in many ways, except they're bigger, and they are no longer those societies are central governing power may be completely geographically separated from the lands it is attempting to control and colonize, right? Just like Britain and its colonies in the Americas. It was completely separate. It was not connected by land. Um, so that's this global scale society starts to reach out beyond just a neighboring territory. Global scale societies, whether the two go hand in hand or not, is something, you know, kind of like does agriculture and large scale societies go hand in hand? Is one dependent on the other? Who knows? Um, we could argue about that probably all day. Global scale societies with these two traits right here, the rise of industrialism and emphasis on resource extraction, doesn't the rise of industrialism help give rise to global scale societies or do global scale societies give rise to industrialism chicken the chicken come first the egg that's kind of the, the situation i see here not that it's not an interesting discussion but i guess I'm essentially trying to say i don't know um industrialism obviously developed after 1492 so maybe global scale societies encourage industrialism but you know that's just that's that's just spinning things off here without a real careful analysis and I definitely de deserve some good question there but I'm getting distracted um, global scale societies so two of their big traits is global scale societies see have seen a ri the rise of industrialism whereas before people definitely used the land for agriculture for firewood you know for hunting and over hunting and extermination of other animals has already been occurring in large scale societies by this time but with the rise of industrialism, suddenly the need for more so-called resources, and I use that term as a culturally weighted term, resources means things that you have a right to take, whereas gifts from the earth means relatives are giving things to you that you take with honor and with respect, two different ways of looking at it. Um, so industrialism depends very much on the resource paradigm. And with the rise of industrialism, there is a exponentially super increased demand for or the earth's resources to power the industrial machine the the factories and everything that they are creating the the power that needs to go to power the factories the materials that need to be made at the factories the mines that are going on and how you power those mines and the materials needed to create the tools you need for mining and industrialism just really exacerbates that uh, need for what this uh, uh, industrial culture would call resources. Oh, in fact, this rise of industrialism and the need for resource extraction, uh, anthropologist John Bodley, um, in his book, Victims of Progress, he talks about how with the rise of industrialism, overnight the European nations ate up all their resources. You know, they just, they, they went through them so quickly and then they turned around and said, oh, let's look to our colonies. Um, and where we haven't colonized yet, let's go and grab their resources too because we'll just colonize them and start sucking things out of their, their territories. And the places they were looking at, of course, were the homelands of native peoples, indigenous peoples around the world. And this is really where we start to see um, the rise of the need for indigenous environmental movements. Global scale societies, one of their defining traits is that they are based in the ideology of growth, population growth, um, economic growth, uh, mater good growth in, ma in materials, uh, your, your use of materials. Everything constantly has to keep expanding. To not expand, to hold still, to be at what tribal societies would call equilibrium in global scale societies is considered stagnation. Along with this ideology of growth, it's this constant emphasis on change for the sake of change. You always, you know, your iPhone, what are we even on now? I don't know. I don't use these things. Um, I'm back at iPhone 3. So what, on iPhone 11 maybe? So your iPhone 11 is not going to be good enough in a year or two. You have to have the iPhone 12. Why? Well, nobody really knows because iPhone 11 works just great. But, you know, the iPhone 12 has got to be better. 
it's it's change change for the sake of change and this of course helps the economy there's a whole thing economists talk about called built-in obsolescence you know if you're buying new things you're generating more um, ca income into the economy more ca cash exchange exchange of money and that all grows the economy so on and so forth everything has to keep growing to stay the same is to stagnate uh, so there's yeah there's 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 that that whole idea and even this emphasis on constant growth constant change we also start to develop um, as we saw in the 1940s and 1950s a whole worship of what's called the youth culture and I'm not saying that people who are from younger generations are bad um, I've been saying this since I was in high school right so uh, it's not somebody who's like oh yeah you're over 30 now so guess what you're going to be saying <laughs> I've been saying this for for since I was a kid myself um, but this uh, this whole thing we we worship youth and once you really do hit 30 kind of that came out of the 60s right you know we don't trust anybody over 30 we have that whole concept out there still we look at older people as standing in the way of progress um, we uh, generation gap was cultivated in the 1940s and 1950s so the younger generations and the older generations would look at each other as almost enemies as people who didn't understand each other and all of that is so untrue but it's all part of that idea that change is great, that if we were to stay still, i.e. honor older generations and their ways of doing things, that we're stagnating, that somehow we're not advancing if we do that sort of thing. This is all in direct contrast to tribal societies who honor all the generations and think, think all generations bring equal and valuable gifts to the circle. Um, so yeah, the ideology of growth spawns many different many different things um, that, that get associated with that. Of course, the idea is you can't have infinite growth on an infinite planet, whether you're talking about population or you're talking about material expansion or even economic expansion. You're going to run out of things. You're going to run out of land. You're going to run out of resources sooner or later. And before you run out of those things, you're going to have destroyed so much that you're going to make life just really awful for everybody who's left behind, if it's even possible, because you've destroyed so many of your other relatives, your non-human relatives along the way. Like uh, large-scale societies, global-scale societies, um, one of their defining traits is predatory expansion. It's the same as large-scale societies only. It's not just against your neighboring territories. It's now global. You, these societies go across oceans, like I said. And because global-scale societies have an insatiable and an extremely high demand for resources, even more than large-scale societies, what remains of rural and wild lands are targeted for colonization, um, whether it's colonization to gain control or just colonization to extract resources. These are where the so-called resources, what the tribal societies would call gifts of the earth, are located because they're the only places left that haven't been ravaged um, by large scale or global scale society. As part of this, uh, global scale society is part of ideology of growth, part of industrialism, part of expansion. Um, Industrial production and extraction are continuously intensified. They keep growing, they keep escalating. They never cut back, they never go back. So this is why when we start talking, oh, the solution to, well, we only talk about climate change. We don't talk about all our other environmental problems. So they've defined the problem as only climate change. And so then they say, we have to get off of fossil fuels, which of course is true. And so they say, but since they define the situation so narrowly, they say, so now we need industrial production of wind turbines and um, electric vehicles. And we're going to be fine. We'll be great. But they're ignoring all the other aspects of that industrialism, all the other horrible things industrialism is doing to the planet. And you need industrialism for wind turbines and electric vehicles. Um, but they're going to intensify production, intensify extraction in order to produce these wind turbines and electric vehicles and other such non-solutions to our environmental issues. And they're going to call it good. They're going to call it a solution. In fact, Bill McKibben has says, yes, we have to develop more wild lands. We have to destroy more wild lands to have wind power. Um, so let's do it so we can solve climate change. It's, it's a completely very limited focus that keeps us rooted in this uh, worldview of, of constant growth, intensified industrial production, and constant expansion. So it, it's, it's a non-solution because it's not looking at the actual problems. Again, we'll talk all more about all of this so much more in depth as we go through different lectures here. 
The goal of global scale society is everything must benefit the national economy. Doesn't matter whether we're talking about a capitalistic society, which yes, is particularly bad um, in, in many different respects, but communist and socialist economies have proven that they are just as environmentally destructive and just as destructive to indigenous peoples as well. So it doesn't matter what Western economic philosophy, I should say, what civilized economic philosophy you're coming from. That is what city-based economic philosophy you are coming from. It doesn't matter which of those city-based economic philosophies you're coming from, whether it's capitalism, communism, or socialism, all which have urban centers at the center of power, all which are based on industrialism and, and resource extraction. Any of these three are still continuing to be and have proven themselves to be environmentally destructive and destructive towards indigenous peoples. Population levels of global scale societies sharply start to sharply increase within the last 500 years. We have really entered a sharp incline in the J curve as we will see. And a large percentage of the population globally do now do, in, in global scale societies no longer live on the land. Um, yeah, I'll leave it at that right now. I think with corporatocracy, we'll get into that a little bit more. Um, people are being have been pushed off the land and we'll talk about it in other lectures deliberately in order to create them into pro, what it's literally called productive productive members of the national industrial economy that is they need to be providing labor or resources in some way in order to be considered productive citizens if they are self-sufficient hunters or self-sufficient gatherers or self-sufficient farmers on their own land they are considered as um, holding back the national economy and policies have been instituted even here in the United States to uh, undermine and get rid of such self-sufficient practices. We'll talk all about that in future lectures. Here's the J-curve. Um, during this last 500 years, you know, it took us 200 to 400,000 years um, before we reached 1 billion people. And we reached the first billion pe people of global human population in 1804. 200 to 400,000 years it took us to reach that first billion. Within just a little over 100 years, we added another billion. And then as you can see, within about 30 years, then about 20 years, then about 10 years, we keep adding another billion each. So this is where we get that sharp increase. We are seeing growth in human population numbers at numbers we've never seen before. Um, and when I say this, I want to be very clear. We are not just talking about, you know, so often liberals or conservatives, anybody who's talking population issue, they point their fingers at places like Africa or South America. Those places, yes, they have a high birth rate right now, but the most populous regions in the world are China, India, Europe, and the United States. So see, we all went through our population explosions and we're still have high population growth rates. But now we sit back and we act like, oh no, it's not us. It's all those other people. But no, it very much is us. It's very much the United States. It's very much Europe um, as well as, as other places. It's, it's a global thing, but we can't sit back and say, well, we had our population, major population explosion, you know, a couple hundred years ago. And so now we're going to point fingers at everybody else because we're now at a level where every time we increase our population, we're increasing it um, at extremely high levels because our population numbers in, year, in the U.S. and Europe are already so high. Global scale societies are still about their violent expansion of territories. However, they get perhaps what some might call a little more sophisticated as we'll take a look at, um, particularly as we move into the corporatocracy, corporations use state governments, national governments to achieve their ends in ways that make it even more difficult to kind of point out what they're doing and, and resist them. But what they, but people will still do as we shall see. Um, in general with global scale societies and with large scale societies, the tribes hold out. Tribal societies, yes, keep getting colonized, keep kind of getting bulldozed under this wave of large scale society expansion and then global scale society expansion. But in the year 1800, in the year 1800, literally half of the world's land was still in tribal people's hands. 
half of the world's land in 1800 was still in tribal people's hands. It was only after 1800 that the tribal um, societies began to lose rapidly, lose those lands rapidly. And that had everything to do with industrialism, which started in the 1700s and um, population growth of these industrial nations and people needing, quote unquote, needing, thinking they needed, demanding resources for to feed this industrial machine. And suddenly you start to see um, tribal territory is just decimated over the next century. By the 1900s, things are really terrible uh, for tribal peoples around the world, indigenous peoples around the world. All right, this is a picture here of England and its colonization, you know, and this is exactly what we're talking about with global scale societies, just reaching out with tentacles, with octopus tentacles everywhere around the globe. Veho is a Cheyenne word. It's the word they use actually for the settlers, for the so-called quote-unquote white man, as many people talked in that parlance back in the 1800s. It means a spider in its cocoon because they were seeing the same thing as we're seeing here in this picture is just a reaching out everywhere to kind of, as a predator, to pull in everything that the spider or this colonial octopus is seeking and trying to just grab a hold of, of everything. That's what the Cheyenne we're seeing. That's what this cartoonist was seeing with England, the Cheyenne we're seeing with the United States. All right, so there's, you could argue that we're still in a global scale society because that's very true, we are. But you could also define it a little more, refine your definition a little bit more by saying we're not only a global scale society, we have shifted into a corporatocracy or what some people might call a corporocracy. This essentially means rule by the corporations. A corporatocracy or a corporocracy has almost all of the sim similar traits as large scale and global scale. Again, just with, you know, a slightly more, um, I could say more intensive, more intense, intensifying those traits. Corporatocracies, corporocracies, you could date this back to the, the Bill Clinton administration in the mid 1990s when he helped establish, you know, with this is something that was set in motion by Republicans and Democrats. You know, I think it was set in motion. Some of it was set in motion by, um, I know it was by President George Bush, the first one, H.W. Bush, not George W. Bush, but his father. He set in motion this process for globalization. And, and you know, he was just one person who was a part of this much larger effort uh, to lead into the corporatocracy. And when Bill Clinton took office, Democratic President Bill Clinton took office in the 1990s, he is the one that established things like the World Trade Organization. Um, and these, all of this was geared towards empowering corporations and giving them more power through our governmental institutions. So essentially, while we may elect politicians to sit in the government's the ones who hold a lot of power in a corporatocracy or corporocracies are the corporations and their and their corporate or economic interests. So the seat of power in a corporatocracy or corporocracy lies with the multinational corporations. Um, they are the ones who have the biggest influence on the decisions that are being made at the government level. And of course, the government is issuing its decisions and those have impacts on all of us at the at the small scales here, down here in the families and the communities. Some traits of the corporatocracy or corporocracy. Uh, this is what I would call a global predatory economics and a hierarchy. You know, we have this whole, the corporations kind of look at the world as in many ways a factory floor. Um, you know, you, you extract resources in one, one country, you ship them off to another factory to be processed, and you ship them off to another, usually a wealthier country, to be sold, and it's going all over the world, and people are being impacted, and lands are being impacted. Um, there's uh, constant expansion into, you know, whether it's through mines or pipelines or um, power lines, what have you, all these different ways the corporation colonizes rural areas, wild areas, indigenous lands of indigenous peoples are included in much of that category there. And there's a whole hierarchy in the world of power, um, in terms of power, in terms of economics with corporations and CEOs and, and the wealthy at the top, right? And the rest of us, most of the rest of us down at the bottom. Um, but also in terms of politically, the corporations, 
kind of rule the world and governments fall into line underneath them. They have less status and power in this corporatocracy or corporocracy than the corporations do. So-called national interests that are used to sell uh, campaigns or other things to the people of a particular nation are really uh, euphemisms for the corporate interest. So we have a, well, our national interest is to go into this country to protect this, you know, this this resource that we have a vested interest in. But really, what it means is it's not the nat into the national interest; it's in the corporate interest. And we have conflated, we have melded together that what is in the corporate interest is also in our interest as a nation too, as though the two are inseparable and one and the same. Um, notice it's not what is in the interest of the family or what is in the interest of the local community or what is in the interest of the individual is the same as the national interest. That's not what we say. What it has become is what is in the in a corporatocracy or corporocracy is what is in the corporate interest is what is the national interest. In a corporatocracy or corporocracy, the people within that society, society, everybody, pretty much everybody has been made dependent on the moneyed economy. And I say has been made. We'll talk about that in future lectures because there have been deliberate policies set in place to make that a reality so that people are not self-sufficient, but instead need to obtain money in order to purchase the basic necessities of life, including food and housing. In a corporatocracy or corporocracy, there's less and less land. This is a global scale thing. There's less and less land that has been left unmolested. Um, so those rural and wild lands that are left become heavily targeted for resource extractions in the name of the corporate, i.e. what has become identified as the national interest. Other things that we see in the corporatocracy or corporocracy is the rise of neo-environmentalism. Um, whereas environmentalism in the past has been heavily critical of corporations, we and, you know, um, opposed to corporate agendas and corporate colonizations of land, the neo-environmental movement actually feels that corporations or argues that or rationalizes that corporations can help the environment if we just allow corporations to profit from um, so-called green green products, green energy production, what have you. So in other words, what we have is we have environmental rationalizations for why we should allow a large-scale solar farm to go into and destroy a desert habitat, right? Or we have economic argue or environmental arguments as to why we should allow a corporation to go to uh you know off the coast of massachusetts for example and put in a large-scale wind farm a large-scale wind project even though it's going it's already damaging um the marine life that's there um because it's going to be good for the environment but some people refer to this as greenwashing in order for corporations to profit off of our environmental issues off of our environmental problems kind of like um when people see an issue, see something, oh, I can't think of something off the top of my head right now, but essentially when there is an addiction out there or there's a problem out there, like our energy addiction, we have an addiction to energy as a society. And if we see that, like if somebody's addicted to something, it's real easy to sell them the solution, but the point is you sell it to them, right? It doesn't necessarily take care of the addiction, but you make them think it will. Um, and you can make a lot of money from that. And that's how a corporatocracy or corporocracy works. And the rise of new environmentalism, it has been argued that they, it is environmental work that's essentially in the back pockets of corporations. What you guys think, I would like to hear. That would be very, very interesting to know. Corporatocracy, corporocracies are also, they, the ones, you know, this is, we've not had this in human history before. Um, one of the defining traits has become that they are marked by extremely high species extinction rates at rates we have not seen since the last mass extinction event uh, with, with the dinosaurs. At this time, this is the first time in human history, ever in human history, that we know of, that the majority of human beings now live in cities instead of on the land. This happened in the United States some decades ago, 
Um, today, over 80% of people in the United States live in urban areas. Um, tribal people in the United States, people who are tribal members, over 60% of people who are tribal members live in urban areas. So even native people, the majority of them live in urban areas. And in the world, just a few years ago, we passed the marker rate where over 50% of the world's population now lives in cities. So most people no longer are on, living on the land, which means most people are no longer developing a day-to-day -day constant relationship with a particular land and the animals and plants and other beings who make up that land. Um, it's more of a spectator sport now to have a relationship with the land if people have that at all. The goal of a corporatocracy or a corporocracy is that everything must benefit that not only the corporate economy, but the global corporate economy, the global corporate economy. Population levels are on the steep rise with corporatocracies. That is not um, not changing. And again, the majority do not live on the land. In terms of the J curve, we see in 1999, what was the last billion we added was like 1987, I think. 1999, it was, I mean, according to our last slide, it was 1987. 1999 now, you know, just 12 years later, we've added an additional billion, another 12 years, another billion. And within 11 years, we finally added the eighth billion. So we're on a trajectory here where it took us 200 to 400,000 years to have 1 billion humans. And now about every 10, 12 years, we add another billion. That's crazy that the, the earth cannot sustain that sort of population growth. Um, the corporate economy, as we will see in future lectures, is bent on violent expansion. Uh, again, the majority of the world population is urban, which means people are no longer having that developing that daily, much less generations old relationship with the land. And what remains of indigenous lands and indigenous peoples is being heavily targeted because that's where so much of this quote unquote resources still remains. However, ever since the 1970s and just growing in power every year, Indigenous peoples around the world are revitalizing their traditional ways of doing things, their traditional knowledge, their traditional um, philosophies about how to live with the earth. And they're people are mel mel melding this, mingling this with contemporary society. And they continue to be probably one of the most effective um, resistors to the corporate economy. A visual here for what we we're talking about with a corporatocracy, we're no longer talking about pledging allegiance to a government. We may do that superficially, but underneath this is what we're really pledging allegiance to, um, what, what those stars represent. And this is just a, a metaphor, right? This isn't just the United States we're talking about because we're talking corporatocracy is global. Here's a look at our population. We talked a lot about population and it's a major factor of the different types of societies we have had as human beings. Um, this relates back to the PAT equation, which means that the impact, you know, it's not just about our population numbers, but also the impact we have on the earth is related to the number of people we have in our country or society times the uh, material affluence, you know, how materialistic we are times the um, amount of technology we use. So, those of us living in the United States, we have the greatest impact on the earth because our population numbers are so high, our material affluence is so high, and our technological use is so high. We have the greatest impact on the earth. And it's been said numerous times, if everybody on the earth were to live like us, we would need five additional planets. So how fair is that, right? How fair is that to other people? And, that, and how are we, you know, how fair is it that people, that we're living uh, so high on the hog where others can't, and how fair is it that we're doing that and having such an impact on the planet in order to have this kind of a lifestyle? And again, people who get impacted, indigenous peoples are some among some of the most um, prominent people who are impacted by these sort of lifestyles, as we shall see and as we'll be continue to talk about. Just another visual. This is a light pollution map that comes from NASA. It shows, I think, even more effectively the Pat equation. To wrap up here, some concluding thoughts. 
John Bodley talks about how the Industrial Revolution unleashed what he calls an unprecedented assault on tribal peoples around the world because those European nations ate through their so-called resources overnight to fuel their industrial machine. They looked to all these indigenous lands, these beautiful, wild, healthy indigenous lands as, wow, look at what we can extract from there. And so they just launched out um, looking to colonize indigenous lands in order to feed that industrial machine the national economies and keep on empowering the ideology of growth. What's interesting is when Onola Duke is an Anishinaabe or Ojibwe activist, uh, she's run for vice president under the Green Party with Ralph Nader. Done, she's just done amazing things. Um, she says that with civilizations disconnect from the land, you know, city-based societies, when they become disconnected from the land, that they themselves have been colonized. And she points out that the word colonized actually has at its root the word colon, like your digestive tract. She says this means when you're colonized, you become digested into this civilized way of life, right? So um, this is kind of an interesting way to, to think about it. So throw that out there for food for thought. Keeping in mind that our population explosions, when we talk about population numbers, it is because ever since we started on with large-scale societies, urban-based societies, we have launched ourselves into these population explosions that have led to, you know, um, a billion people being added every 10, 12 years on this planet, which is completely unprecedented in, in human history. Both in Europe in the United States and other places that are industrializing, China is it when it eventually industrialized in other places and the industrialization really, you know, large scale societies have, have created tremendous pressures on tribal peoples and indigenous lands and the land in general um, that have been very destructive, but industrialization just exacerbates that, ramps up that destruction um, to umpteenth degrees. And finally, something we'll take a look at in future lectures as the colonization of indigenous lands happened in the last 500 years, both Europe and the Americas, United States, even Canada, used all sorts of cultural rationalizations to say, well, we essentially have a divine mission. It is our responsibility as developed, industrialized, advanced, these are all in quotes, kind of idea, um, people, to bring the light of our civilization to these backward areas of the world. You know, uh, that's not my words. Those are words coming from these rationalized missions that we, as we destroy indigenous lands, as we destroy, destroy indigenous peoples, as we kill them, as we destroy their cultures, we are actually doing a good thing for them and for the planet because this is all part of progress. This is all part of advancement. And therefore we must persist even as our consciences might plague some of us, you know, because this is all really for the greater good that it's, it's, it's okay to do this. Nowadays, people are starting to wake up to the fact from these colonial societies, you know, indigenous people have been pointing this out ever since forever, but people are starting to wake up from these colonial societies and say, um, maybe we got it wrong somewhere along the line. And so people are starting to look actually to indigenous peoples these days and saying, can you help us? Can you kind of show us where, where things have gone wrong, where we got off track? And it's really important to remember that small-scale tribal peoples defended themselves against states and empires for more than 6,000 years. And by 1800, half the world was still occupied by independent tribal societies. Um, but since 1800, with the spread of industrialism and the Euro European and American population explosions, those pressures on indigenous peoples escalated so greatly that there was major devastation and loss in the 1800s. And so we are you know, still reeling from that um, around the world. Indigenous peoples are still reeling from that and everybody is reeling from that in terms of environmental and social impacts. Just a reminder of our time scale that we talked about in the first lecture about the idea that this way of living, we are not stuck in it. This is such a small fraction of human existence. Um, that to me, that's where the greatest hope is, is that this isn't, this isn't just the way the world works. It isn't at all. The way the world works, is something much different. And because it's the way we have done it for hundreds, tens, if not hundreds of thousands of years, 
It shouldn't be that hard to figure out how to get back to doing it because it's who we are as human beings. It is human to be at peace with the planet. It is human to live in happy, healthy societies um, where people are looked after, everybody's looked after, and everybody's cared for. That's what it means to be human. Um, so we got to remember that as we face so much of the stuff that we're, the stresses and the crises that we face today. This isn't what it means to be human. This is an aberration. Um, and we need to figure out how to get back to what it is to be human. Really, we have to figure out how to become human again. There's a Medewin teaching I want to leave you with, which comes from the Anishinaabe, whom some know as the Ojibwe or Chippewa, and it also includes the Odawa and Badawatomi, and I'll be talking about those names later in other lectures and, and be spelling those out for you. But the Medewin are a major religious society within the Anishinaabe um, people, and one of their teachings is that we all have this good path to walk on and, and it's used it's, it's called the Gizek tree the Gizek teaching i'm sorry um and you see that center line that center rib of what you could call the Gizek leaf the cedar leaf that's the good path every individual or every society has that that's meant for them to be walking on this is the good path but we get distracted all the time by all these little paths off here and then even maybe littler paths and littler paths we get distracted from that good path but the teaching here, the Gizek teaching, the Cedar teaching, is that we can retrace our steps. You know, we don't have to stay distracted. We can retrace our steps and get back to that good path. This applies to individuals, and it applies to societies too. So really, how do we get to that good path? Something we'll be taking a look at off and on as we go through different lectures here in, in this, this series. Um, but it would be great to have ideas as we go along, and I'd love to hear what your ideas and your thoughts are. Some things to think about that will be touched on in future lectures. Something like a seventh generation sustainability plan. Realizing we don't have to make change overnight. That there are some things that do have to change immediately. And there are other things we can work on in the long term. Many indigenous societies talk about making decisions and thinking about how those decisions will impact people, human people, and non-human people seven generations from now. Um, so if we think in that context, we have, if we have seven generations, if we have 150 to 200 years to get society in shape, where can we be in that time? Um, if you think about it, 150, 200 years ago, here in the Northern Great Lakes area in Anishinaabe, Akane, Anishinaabe territory, people were living traditional lives as Anishinaabe people. Within 150 to 200 years, that world completely flipped completely flipped in a bad way. So I guess the question is, how can we make the world completely flip over the next 150 and 200 years in a good way? Because change happens and change can happen. Um, change doesn't, isn't always good, like we can see with the last 150 to 200 years for the Anishinaabe, but it can be good when you're in that bad spot and you need to get back to that good path, right? So some thoughts we'll be thinking about. I'd love to hear it as we keep on going through over the next um, several lectures, next several weeks here, what your ideas and your thoughts are and how we can get back to that good path and what that good path actually constitutes. All right, that's it for me. Um, wraps up this short history of humankind, which may not seem so short when you're having to listen to it, but you know, is, is really meant to be an abbreviated version of the last 400,000 years. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we will talk to you guys later, and I look forward to hearing your thoughts and ideas, um, and please, please, please do share those. All right, take care.